based in Australia. I see some familiar faces on uh, the call from my previous trip to the Philippines. So I'm very glad to be able to be with you once again this afternoon. It's actually an afternoon here in Australia. I'm, I'm at work. I've had blocked up some time to spend with you. And so I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be able to connect. Um, out of curiosity, before we get into our presentation and breakout session this afternoon, I uh, just want to see uh, there's all, over 100 people, I think, in, in the room. I'm just curious to know how many of you are actually um, students. So if you've got the hand raising function on Zoom, you can raise your hand. If you're a student, can you raise your hand so I can see, like, just get a number? It's my whole screen gone. It's, it's a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Great, fantastic. Um, okay, you can put your hands down now. If you are a um, working person, if you have a job, if you're a working professional, maybe you can um, put your hand up now so I can see as well. Good mix. Great, fantastic. It's always nice to know who I'm speaking to. And it's really tricky um, during Zoom to be able to get an idea of who I'm talking to, especially because everyone is not responding and then you're not in the same room. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to move even this afternoon as we share about the topic. Jesus, and I put here Jesus excellence. I've got someone who's a full-time one, fantastic as well. Great. Let's say a quick word of prayer again as we get started, and then we'll get right into it. I'll give a quick introduction about what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking. I've split my sessions up across today and also Saturday morning, Sabbath morning, and so there will be some continuation between the two segments. And if you are interested in following through, that's the flow of the presentations will be both today and Saturday as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We are grateful for the chance to ascend higher because the Holy Spirit lifts us, and we pray that your continual guidance uh, will be with us this afternoon, even as we open your word to understand the meaning and the definition of excellence and how that applies in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm scheduled to speak for about an hour and a half. I won't go straight through. I'll try and give you some breaks. If you have questions, I believe you can ask those questions as well. I want this to be as interactive as possible. And so I'm not going to do a very deep theological study this afternoon, but I'm going to spend a lot of time talking a little bit more about things we face on an everyday basis. When you hear the word excellence, people often think about being perfect. People talk about being at the highest standard possible. People talk about a whole range of things. And the definition of excellence in society is one that relates to being as good as you can. Often that means beating someone else. Often that means competing with others. Often that means succeeding at the expense of others. But today what I want to spend a little bit of time doing is changing the concept of what excellence is and how the Bible defines it and how Jesus, through some examples in the Bible, can help us to better understand what that looks like. I want to start off the presentation today by telling you a little bit about something I did a few weeks ago. Anyone done this activity before? This is bouldering. If you've ever done bouldering before, you'll know that it really helps to be tall. Unfortunately, I'm not so tall. So bouldering is really tricky for me. And if you're skinny and tall, you've got a huge advantage. For those of you who haven't done bouldering before, basically what bouldering is, is it's like a fake or a um, man-made constructed rock face with these little struts or rocks that stand out. And what your aim is to do is to climb from the bottom to the top by color codes. You'll see in the picture here, the different colors. And based on the colors, you are only allowed to use the same colors to either hold or to step on as you try to get from the bottom of the, the um, cliff, man-made cliff or ground level right to the top. So obviously the colors represent different difficulties and some colors will be easier than others. So in this particular um, thing. I think you can see that blue is pretty hard. And this uh, lady is doing the, I think the blue level. And you can see that you sometimes have to go sideways or hang upside down to be able to achieve that. And so this was quite tricky for me. So I started at the basic level in, in my bouldering um, gym, the, bold, the basic level uh, was blue, and then it went to red, and then it went to purple. And so I got, I did most of the red ones okay, and they got the purple and got really, really, really tricky. And one of my um, 
bouldering uh, buddies who was in the group was up to yellow. Yellow is like insane level hard. That's the hardest level. And to start the yellow for one of these bouldering climbs, you have to hang upside down on your feet and then flip yourself up to then climb the rest of the wall. It's really tricky. And I could clearly say that I am not an excellent boulder because I only got to the red or to the uh, bit of the purple level, but other people going to white and black and yellow. And so sometimes that's how we define excellence or we think the Bible defines excellence. Because if you look at this Bible verse, you actually see that excellence is sometimes defined as this. Now, as you excel, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. It says, now as you excel in everything, in faith, speaking, knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in the love we inspired in you, see that you also excel in this gracious work. Many people think that excellence means you have to be good at all these things. You have to have strong faith. You have to be a good speaker. You can preach a sermon, teach a Bible study, give a devotional talk. You have to have significant Bible knowledge. So lots and lots of facts and figures and, and lots of trivia about the Bible. And in all earnestness, you have to be a hard worker for God. And in the love we inspired in you. So you need to love others to the best of your capability and also to excel in having grace. Many people see this as the levels of or the number of components that make up excellence. And so they say, oh, I'm not such a good speaker. Maybe I need to work on that. I don't know so much Bible knowledge. I don't have my faith is not, not strong all the time. And they try their best to increase in these different levels, much like you go from blue to red to purple to, to black to white to yellow in the bouldering capability. They try and say, well, I've got two or three of these things. And maybe I've only got one. Maybe I've got four. And then they subconsciously compare themselves to others. You know, a really excellent person is someone who has good faith, is speaking at PYC, knows everything about the Bible, can answer all questions, works really hard for God, and is also able to show this grace to others. When actually, I think they misinterpret this verse. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time digesting that and really bring it back to something that all of us can experience. A Christian author once wrote this, you can run into mediocrity accidentally, but you have to purpose to be excellent. You, have, you can run into mediocrity accidentally, but you have to purpose to be excellent. And that is exactly where this Bible verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 starts. It's not about the things you do. It's not about the amount of knowledge you have. It's not about the capacity or the capability or the talents that you may have and may be using, but it is the purpose behind all those things that makes someone excellent. When I talk about purpose here, I'm not talking about God's purpose for your life or God's purpose for your career. Those things are important. But what I want to spend this session today and the session on Saturday where I'll be speaking again, talking a little bit about is this concept of finding purpose in times of difficulty. You will know that all, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter whether you're um, black or white, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, everyone faces difficulty. And the true characteristic or the true test of excellence is what happens to your purpose in a time of crisis. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time digesting that in hopefully a very practical way or practical ways that are not only prayerfully going to be useful in your life, but also going to be useful in the lives of others and also for you to be able to share to people who are non-Christian or non-Adventist. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about purpose today. Let me start off by talking about this. I work as a pediatric doctor. I live in Melbourne in Australia. And um, in my practice, when I was deciding what I wanted to do in my life, I thought a little bit about different career options. Maybe I could be a firefighter or a police officer or an accountant or a management consultant. But I decided to follow along to become a pediatrician or a doctor at that time before specializing in pediatrics because I was inspired by this particular quote. And I think the pen of inspiration here writes a quote that sets this tone very nicely as we continue our discussion in Jesus, the excellent. 
Ministry of Healing, page 117, it says, if the physician, but I've substituted the words here, if the worker or the student, I asked you guys before, who was a student, who was a young professional who's working, this quote is really powerful. It says, if the physician or worker or student, put your name in there, faithfully and diligently strives to make himself efficient in his profession, if he consecrates himself to the service of Christ and takes time to search his own heart, he will understand how to grasp the mysteries of his sacred calling. Notice it doesn't say that an excellent doctor or excellent worker or excellent engineer or accountant or student is someone who gets the top marks or someone who achieves the highest score or someone who beats the rest of the class. It says that the person who faithfully and diligently strives to make himself efficient, it is not about the output necessarily that makes you excellent. It is about the intention and the purpose behind what you do in your life. I broke it down a little bit more and I started to translate that. You can see here on the screen, I put little numbers next to this. This quote has really inspired me because I started to dig into exactly what does that look like? And so when the rubber hits the road, when you see these numbers, there are really four things here. Number one, make himself or herself efficient. Number two, consecrating themselves. Number three, understanding what it means to be in the service of Christ. Number four, searching his own heart. And really what you see here, when the rubber meets the road, as we say here in Australia, when it comes down to the summary, the summary of excellence for a physician, for a doctor, for a dentist, for an engineer, for an accountant, for a, um, any profession, any whether you're a student or a mum or a parent even looking after a child, is four things. Excellence in your professional career. That may be excellence in your studies. It may be in your new job. It may be in multiple jobs, a consecrated personal spiritual life, dedicated to service and ministry, and that will help you to discover your ultimate calling, which is really the theme of today's breakout session, but the theme of PYC this year, which is to ascend higher than the highest, to ascend because Jesus is lifting you up to your ultimate calling. I'm going to spend a little bit of time not dwelling on these key four key points, but this really sets the foundation of what we're talking about today. The foundation is, it doesn't matter whether you're like me, a doctor, or whether you're like anyone else who uh, in the room, whatever profession that may be, whether you are the only Adventist in your family or whether you are in a place full of Adventists in your classroom, the fundamentals are the same. Excellence is a purpose that manifests itself in all facets of your life, personal, professional, spiritual, and service. Many of us will know what this is. I think you've seen it, you've seen pictures of it, maybe some of you have experienced it yourself or family members, some sad stories I know. Uh, here in Australia, thankfully, um, COVID-19 is not as perhaps as severe as some countries overseas, but I understand that in the Philippines, it's a challenging and tricky situation, and hence we're meeting online this year. One of the things that COVID has outlined is that everyone will face difficulty in life. Everyone was not immune to COVID. Some may be more affected than others, but this is something that affects everyone. And when it affects everyone, the key thing that determines whether you come through the other side is the concept of purpose and excellence. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit more, not so much on COVID, but what it has illustrated for us. I'm going to try and cover three topics, two today and one on Sabbath morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about emotional intelligence or EQ. I will talk a little bit about resilience. I'm going to talk a little bit about persuasion as well. These three things are generic, but apply to everyone in this room, I believe. Everyone has the concept or has emotional intelligence. It's a matter of how much and how that's used. There's a concept of resilience that helps us to manage stress, that helps us to deal with difficulty, that helps us to manage unexpected consequences. And there's also the concept of understanding influence and persuasion. This doesn't mean to manipulate someone, or maybe it does. We'll find that out in our next talk. Let's start off with the first one, and I'll go and hopefully break this down for you using some biblical examples as well to illustrate the concept of purpose and excellence. This may be you as you're preparing for an assignment or an exam or a test or a deadline. How many of you have experienced stress before? I think all of you would say yes, right? 
I often see people that experience stress. Maybe you're stressed even now. You're like, I need to get out of work. I need to go watch the thing. I see I'm too stressed, can't study anymore. Maybe you're stressed. And when you're stressed, you experience something we call the flight or fight response. Flight or fight response. Maybe some of you would have um, seen this concept before, experienced this concept before. This is a natural response that happens in the body. For those of you who are nurses or doctors or in the medical field or in the health sciences, you understand what I'm talking about. A fight or flight response, when you're stressed, let's say a tiger chases you down the road, or for some people, it's not a tiger, but a, a mouse or a spider. Maybe for the girls, they scream when they see them. You get this instant response. You either want to run away as fast as you can, or you want to stay and smack and kill the spider or kill the insect or kill the bee or, or try and do something about it. What you don't notice is that in the back end, inside your body, there are a number of things that happen that actually make this response visible on the outside. As humans, we will feel this response. Your heart rate will go up. Your eyes will dilate open. They will be able to see. You will start to sweat less. Your hairs may stand up on your body. Your adrenaline kicks in and you can run faster than you ever knew you could run before. This is the fight or flight response. And what actually happens in your body is that there is a combination of things and you don't need to memorize all these things here, but this is a scientific diagram made a bit simpler to explain a little bit about what happens. You get a bit of shaking, you feel nauseated, your heart rate goes up, you can see that uh, your face gets flushed, your, your hearing may change. This is because of the hormones that are secreted when you are stressed. When you're stressed, the body releases certain things that causes this to happen. Most of the time, this is temporary. It's good in a temporary situation. But over time, if you are consistently and persistently stressed, then what will happen is that these effects build up, not only on your physical health, but also in your mental and your spiritual health. And you may say, ah, oh, you know, that's okay. Nothing ever happens. I'll be fine. But scientists are starting to actually figure out that the longer that stress goes for and the longer that it continues, the more challenging it is and the more impact it has on your long-term ability to reach excellence. Remember, excellence is not about getting the highest mark or getting the highest score or making the top of the class, but it's about the purpose. The more stressed you are, the less likely you are to be able to achieve the purpose that you set out to achieve in life. So why am I talking about science and health? Let me try and draw the link together. Many of you will have, like I said, read the newspaper and seen lots of information about news. Many of you will have to wear masks as well. I'm not sure if you have to wear a mask in the Philippines where you're at in Australia. Um, in my state, we've just gone back into lockdown as of one week ago. So I'm allowed to not wear a mask when there's no one in the office with me. But wherever else I go, I have to wear a mask that looks something like this on the screen. Uh, for, for a period of time, we had to wear masks on, uh, we still do, on public transport, on, uh, in the airplane, if you're taking a, a flight. Um, even when you go out for a walk, you have to wear one. In the hospital, I have to wear one all the time. I have to change it when I'm seeing different patients. This is something that has uh, become quite normal for us. But at the time, what happened was that things were a bit scary. And so the flight or fight response initially when COVID first broke up was everyone's really scared. I'm not sure about you, but in Australia, the biggest measure for us of people being scared about COVID was that people would rush to the supermarket to buy toilet paper. I'm not sure whether they did the same thing in the Philippines, but they definitely did it here. Everyone went to the supermarket to buy toilet paper. I don't know why they needed toilet paper, but everyone did. And after some time, it became a little bit more settled, but we went into lockdown in Australia here in Melbourne at least four times. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on in my talk. But we went, this is the fourth lockdown that we've had. And the third one that we had, uh, sorry, the second one was actually almost close to 150 days. So that's four and a half months. And we were not allowed to go out of our house for greater than five kilometers away. We could not go to church. We could not do a lot of things. We had some exceptions if you have to go to the hospital and things like that. But there was a lot of... Um, uh, uh, restrictions because of COVID. And people were significantly stressed. We saw significant increases in mental health presentations to hospitals. We saw a lot of people very, very upset. And when they, they um, every time since that time that they've announced a lockdown, we see this increase in spikes. And what I'm trying to get at here is that stress is more 
um, prevalent or more common than you think in people's lives. So you may say, oh, I'm not stressed. I, I eat regularly. I exercise. I, I try and live healthily. But you don't understand that the minute buildup of these things around you that keep the environment that contributes actually contributes to grading or increasing levels of stress over time. And again, that affects your purpose and the ability to be excellent. So it's like, Daryl, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you just tell me what I need to do? Like, just make it clear. Just, just make it simple. Okay. So here's the question I'm going to ask. If you're able to protect yourself against stress, you're more likely to be able to reach your purpose and therefore be excellent. Do you follow the, the hypothesis? If you're more likely to prevent yourself from being stressed, you're more likely to be able to reach your purpose and be excellent. That's my hypothesis today. Now, I'm not talking about eating well and living well and drinking water and having sunshine and, and having rest. Those are important things. I'm talking about long-term chronic stress. Here. Someone put it like this. Feelings are much like waves. We can't stop them from coming, but we can choose which one to serve. I can tell you, as soon as they announced the lockdown one week ago, there was significant discomfort, upset. People were angry, disappointment. People were very sad. And people were resigned to being locked down for another week. That now has become two weeks. So the question is, how do you prevent yourself from falling into those traps by going to be judged by feelings? And the concept is something we call emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is made up of four components. The four components are these, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, known as empathy, and relationship management. And the ability for us to regulate our emotional intelligence will actually contribute to the ability for us to display purpose and excellence in our life. And that's what I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about this afternoon. I'm going to use a Bible story to illustrate this point. Because these things look very much like a university lecture, right? You go to class and the lecturer tells you, you need to be self-aware, you need to manage yourself, you need to be socially aware, and you also need to manage your relationships. Well, that's very easily said, but how do you actually do this? We're going to use a Bible story to try and break it down for you to un help you understand how that looks like. Conflict is one of the situations which produce a flight or fight response, a, a, a stressful situation raises your stress levels. Let me use a scenario to illustrate this point. Some of you may be participants or may be part of a family business. Maybe your father owns a company or a shop or have some sort of business or trade that you're part of. Initially, usually family businesses start off quite well. Everyone works together. Everyone has an equal share. Everyone's opinion is listened to. But over time, things actually get tricky. Sometimes there's a disagreement, there's tensions, people take sides, it gets ugly, then people sue each other, and before long, the company disintegrates. So many people don't like to go into family business because then the family gets torn apart by the business decisions if they don't go well. Conflict in that sort of scenario brings a lot of stress, and it can translate across to personal life, to professional life, sometimes even to church life. I'm going to use an example of how that was the case in a biblical story and how we can learn lessons to help us to buffer against this concept. Abraham and Lot were uncle and nephew. Many of you will have heard this story before, so I don't need to go into a huge amount of detail, but they were successful businessmen. Many of you will remember the story of Abraham and Lot standing, or Abram as he was known then, on the hill looking out over the plains, trying to make a decision. And I'm going to encapsulate that story in the concept of the emotional intelligence this afternoon. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, or you can read along on the screen. I'm going to be looking at the story of Abraham and Lot. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, this is the story of a family business. Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev, which is a different place with his wife and everything that he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Abraham was a successful businessman. He was very rich. He was very wealthy. I think if Abraham lived today, he would be the equivalent of the person who owns Amazon or maybe Microsoft or maybe even Apple or Facebook. He is rich. He's one of these guys. And 
Lot, his nephew, is helping him run his business. He has sheep, cows, goats, camels, silver, gold. Anything you want, he has. In today's language, you'd say he has shares, stocks, cars, Bitcoin, all sorts of diamonds, silver. You get anything he wants, he's got. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place where Bethel and I, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. Let me give you a scenario of what this looks like. Abraham, let's say he was based in the Philippines. He started a small business called Facebook. And then because Facebook became so popular, he went global. So Abraham now goes all over the world, goes to Europe, to Asia, to Africa, to Australia, to America, South America. And then eventually he comes back to the Philippines, right? This is what he's saying. Abraham has gone all over the world, collected all his wealth with his nephew. And he comes back to the place where he's first built an altar, where he started his business. And what the first thing he does there is this. Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. As soon as he lands in his hometown, as soon as he lands right back at the start where he started his business, his first business is to go to build an altar or rather to go to the altar to offer a sacrifice. I want you to remember that point. We'll come back to it. The Bible continues. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. I can imagine how this has gone down, right? Abraham, he's gone overseas. Now wealthy businessman. He can't manage everything. He's the CEO of the company. He's got too many things. I'm going to give Lot an, a, a section of the business to run. And this section of the business, he can run and he can foster and he can earn money and he can take the profit from that section and return the rest, some of the profit and take some of the profit back to the company. And so here, Lot, inheriting part of his uncle's business or section of the business, begins, begins to become a very successful businessman himself. So if you think of it again in everyday language, if Abraham owned Facebook, then maybe Lot was responsible for Facebook Messenger, or maybe he was responsible for Instagram because Facebook bought Instagram, right? So here we have Lot being responsible for a section. and He's getting rich himself, but the land could not support them, the Bible says, while they stayed together for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. It came to the situation that there was too much things or too much possessions so that they could not work in the same space. And how do we know? And quarreling arose between Abraham's herders and lots. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So here's the scenario. They're starting to become tension in the family business. Facebook doesn't agree with Instagram. Uncle's staff don't agree with the nephew staff. And maybe you face that same situation. You may not have a family business, but I can guarantee you, you faced conflict before. Maybe you were in a university group, study group, and everything was going well at the start. And then the project group falls apart, splits down the middle because you don't agree with someone else. Someone in the university study group always does things the wrong way. Maybe you're at church and you're in a youth group, and then there's a split in the youth group. And you're like, nah, that never happens. It always happens. Sad to say. Or maybe you're at work. You used to get along with your colleagues, but they did something wrong. They did something bad. They backstabbed you. They betrayed you. And now there's a big split. There's a quarrel between the two. Everyone's starting to take sides. And you know what it's like in a workplace, in an office. When you take sides, the office is divided in half. It's the people who like that person go there and the people who like side with this person go here. And there's always this constant argument. And whether you're rich or poor, black or white, male or female, this is the situation that everyone faces. And so if we are to be maintain our purpose as Adventists, as Christians, as young people who are passionate to see excellence, we need to understand how to work through these types of issues with purpose. So here's the argument, okay, between Lot and Abraham. Count point and counterpoint, as some people put it. So what can we learn so far? How would you react if you were in this situation? If I was in this situation and I was Abraham, I'd be like, who did, does Lot think he is? All the money that Lot has, I lent him to start off. He should just go away, right? Take his stuff, go down the corridor, do something else somewhere else. Split off the company, take the money and go. Or return me all my money, stop arguing with my stuff. I get precedence, I'm the priority. And sometimes that's how we deal with situations. I'm in the right, they're in the wrong. That's how we manage conflict. And when you get stressful and you start arguing, your blood boils, your voices get raised, you get really stressed and you say, no, I'm right. How can they do that to me? Well, here's what we learned. Number one, 
conflicts reveals your values as, as expressed through your choices. Conflict reveals your values as expressed through your choices. This is the concept of self-awareness. I am sure Abraham knew that there was arguments. I am sure that Abraham knew there was discontent even before the argument started. As he was traveling back to his hometown, as he was going back to the Philippines, let's say, he already knew that there was disagreement. And the first thing he went to do was to be self-aware and he went to the altar to ask for advice. When you're stressed, what's the first thing that you do? When you're in a conflict, what's the first thing that you do? When the hormones, the stress hormones that get released in your body start to go, what do you actually do? We'll talk a lot about stress hormones in the next part of the presentation as we go through, but what do you actually do? Second component here, Abraham is aware of the people around him and their interactions with the situation. You'll notice in the last Bible verse there that the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. The Canaanites and Perizzites are not friendly to Abraham. They are not Christian. They are not Jewish. They are not interested in sharing their land either. Abraham is fully aware that he is a representative of God's character to the people around him. And they would be hostile to anyone or everyone coming into the land. He has to share that space. When you're in conflict with people, are you socially aware of how people perceive you as a Christian? When you deal with conflict and when you manage conflict in a public setting, in a church or at work or at university or at high school, are you aware of how people see God through you? That's what it means to be socially aware. When you're in conflict, what does that say about your values, self-awareness? And when you're in conflict, what do people perceive as God through you? Social awareness. Number one, Abraham went to the altar to ask God for advice. Number two, he is acutely aware that this issue is not just about him and Lot, not just about his possessions and Lot's possessions, but it is also about how it plays out to the rest of the people around Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We talked about 2 Corinthians 8 before, knowledge being something that we want to excel in. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of excellence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of purpose for excellence. Let's continue in our story. So go back to Genesis chapter 13. You'll see here, Abraham said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Abraham takes the initiative to talk to Lot. When you're in conflict with someone, how many of you take the initiative to apologize? When you're in conflict with someone, how many of you think that taking the initiative to apologize or to initiate conversation is excellence? Have you ever thought about that before? Many people say, well, you know, I got wrong, the other person wronged me, so they should come and look for me. They should come and apologize first. If they don't apologize, I'm not talking to them. If they don't come and fix their problem, they don't come and fix their mistake, I'm not going to go back and fix it. And so that is sometimes the, the, the hole that we fall into because the real conclusion here is that Abraham says to Lot, let me take the high road. Hey, Lot, let's have a conversation. Let's not quarrel. We are family. Why are you quarreling? We are close relatives. Abraham, remember, is the person who owns everything. He gave Lot his start in life. He lent Lot money to start his part of the business. He gave him all the advice. He gave him all the business advice that he could ever need. And now he's the one saying, hey, Lot, don't argue. It's okay. Don't worry. Is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. So Abraham gives up his right. It's his right. It's his money. It's his possessions. He says, hey, no, you guys just sort it out. Let's sort it out. You pick Lot. You decide what you want to do. And so Lot looks around and sees the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zohar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. So here's the story, right? Lot they, this is the famous bit, Abraham standing on top of the mountain or the cliff and a lot, and they look out. One side looks really nice with lots of water. The other side looks like a desert. Lot picks the nice side, place where Sodom and Gomorrah is, 
Abraham lives near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched this tents. What does he do as soon as he gets to the place? He builds an altar to the Lord. Abraham is a man of habit, a creature of habit, as we call him. He goes to a place, he builds an altar. He goes overseas, he builds an altar. He comes home, he sacrifices an altar. He gets a new spot. This is He's moving to a new place to start his business, right? He's taking all his business away from all the crowded places. He's going to a new marketplace. He's going to a new zone, new domain. As soon as he gets to the new domain, he builds an altar to the Lord. He is fully self-aware of where his strength and where his purpose comes from. If you were in Lot's shoes, what would you do? Not Abraham. If you were in Lot's shoes, what would you do? Remember, this is about conflict management. There's a conflict resolution. Many of us will be, have been, are in this situation. If you were Abraham, what would you do? If you were Lot, what would you do? And this is the key because the decisions when you're in conflict, under stress, facing stress, facing difficult times, maybe you're locked down by COVID, maybe you lost your job, maybe you um, have a difficult relationship with your family, whatever it may be. If you were in that situation, what does your emotional intelligence tell others about you? What does it tell you about you? Abraham demonstrates self-sacrifice by giving his right up his right to choose. Abraham owns the money. He owns the possessions. He's the older person. He's the uncle. He has every right to choose where he wants to go. He can kick Locke out of the company and leave him bankrupt. When you're in a conflict situation where the right is yours, how do you react? What does that say about your purpose and how does that help you to be more excellent? Human nature tells you that when the right is yours, you go and get that right. Like I'm the rightful owner of this thing. I have the right because someone else wronged me. I have the right because I'm the more important person. I am the person with more power, with more prestige, with a higher uh, 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 title, with more money, whatever it is. And you may be correct. You may have the right. But does that demonstrate self-regulation? When we talk about self-awareness, Abraham always goes to the altar. Self-regulation. What happens when you have the choice to make? So sure awareness, he's aware of the example to others. And he also demonstrates his priorities. What is his priority? Alter spirituality. Maintain family peace. Don't give a bad example to others who are not Christian. That is relationship management. Can you imagine? You go and visit Canaan and per- the Canaanites and the Perizzites. The first thing they'll say is, oh, you're Abraham. You're the one who let your nephew choose. Why did you let your nephew choose? You're the more important businessman. So you can imagine Abraham gets invited to go and give a talk on business, gets invited to give a business uh, management seminar. People ask me, excuse me, uh, Abram, can you tell us why you made such a, such a radical decision? You gave all your riches away and all the potential in Sodom and Gomorrah to your nephew. And you went to this desert over there where you have got to work even harder to earn back all the money. Imagine Abraham's ability and the opportunity to share. So I want to ask you a very simple question. I don't know what you're facing during COVID-19 or during lockdown or during restrictions or because of the pandemic. The pandemic, while important to manage and deal with on a public health scale, that's not what we're talking about today. But it has presented an opportunity because there have been conflicts that have come out of the pandemic. Attention with work, tension with study, tension about what you want to do in your life, about relationships, about your management of relationships with family, anything. But conflict, all it does, the stress that comes with it, helps to reveal your priorities and your values. And in order for you to understand true excellence, you have to see what you do when conflict comes. Do you run and say, no, it's my right to do this, my right to do that? Or do you self-regulate because you're self-aware? Are you aware of how that is played out in people around you and how you manage your relationships with others? 
The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 23, the hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent and their lips promote instruction. The hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent and their lips promote instruction. Just last week, I faced a situation of conflict. i share briefly about, you're not going to name any names here. I had um, produced some work documents, a guideline of some sort, and the guideline was to be shared um, privately. I had made it uh, for private use and some people had asked me for it and I shared with them and I had uh, given it to them for their use in their own area. And this was a guide that uh, basically outlined certain key things to do once you finish your training as a doctor and, and so on and so forth. Unbeknownst to me, some in some meetings that had happened in my workplace, people had started talking about this guide. It was never supposed to be something that uh, was circulated widely. It was just something I made on the site. And then before I knew it, they had sent out, someone had sent out a public email on a list attaching this guide for anyone who wanted to use it, but they had attributed this guide to someone else having created it. I was like, oh, this is interesting. That was my guide. I made the guide. It was supposed to be used for a piece of work and it was only for private use. And someone has now taken it and gone and actually circulated it to everyone without any consent and labeled it as their own piece of work. So I was naturally a little bit puzzled. So I went to investigate, found out a little bit. I got really annoyed because someone had taken my piece of work without asking, knowingly asked someone else for the piece of work, passed it off as their own, and then passed it off as their own for a public forum, claiming the credit for the entire piece of work and to all the whole workplace organization. I was upset. See this picture here? That's how I felt. Like someone had vacuumed up the ideas from my brain. That's conflict. Simple thing. We face this on an everyday basis. No, it may not be big. You don't have to solve the world's problem. Who should be the next president of, of your country or whatever. But this is everyday practice. I was annoyed. And people were like, Daryl, I know that's your piece of work. My friends, some of my colleagues come and told me, email me, texted me, say, hey, someone's passing your work off as this. I'm like, what do you want to do about it? Do you want me to write a letter? Whatever, whatever. I was upset. I was like, that's not right. That's not fair. I almost felt like maybe how Abraham felt, right? So how can someone do this to me? How can it be possible? It's interesting because I was preparing for this seminar and I was reading the passage about Abraham. And I was like, I could be like Abraham or I could be like a not Abraham. And I said, I was praying about it. I said, God, what is important here? Is it about the credit? Am I upset because someone else has claimed the credit for my work? Am I upset because I'm not recognized? Because someone else gets the recognition above me? Am I upset because someone has lied to me and betrayed me? What am I upset about? And what is important to me? Is it, am I going and getting very annoyed because I want to be someone that is recognized? And so that's where emotional intelligence comes in. You get stressed. It's like, oh, I need to write an angry letter to back to this person. I need to call that person straight away. I need to text that person straight away, confront them and do all these things. And on and on it goes. And sometimes that's how we want to manage conflict situations. I prayed about it a little bit more. And I said, look, I just need to understand. So I had a chat with the person. I said, look, what happened? What? Like I saw this, you know, it went out. How did it play out? What, why, why does it look like this? I didn't get angry. I was, I was angry inside. I pray, God, please help me to not get angry and help me to have a rational conversation with this person. And so the person then told me, oh, sorry, I didn't know it was your work. I, I thought it was, um, I thought someone had made it and you know, therefore I thought it was going to be useful for everyone. So I just sent it to someone and someone thought that I, I had made it and so therefore wrote that in the email when actually I didn't know who it was. Whether or not that's true is not the point. That's, I think that's, that's besides the point of the story. The point of the story is we have to go through conflict every day and we have choices to make whether it affects us and others around us as to how we deal with that. And that helps you to stay true. When my friends ask me afterwards, they're like, do you talk to the guy, right? Like, what did you say? Did you do like tell him off? Did you complain to the boss? Did you do this? Did you do that? And I said, no. Because the aim of this is not for me to get credit. I'm not interested in getting the credit for the work. That's not important to me. It's not about my name being smeared. It's not that someone claimed credit for my work, even though that may be wrong. But the aim is to understand 
to them, what does a Christian look like in times of conflict? How can a piece of work that can be useful for others without the issues of credit and without the issues of, uh, of who gets recognition be an example to be used for others in the workplace that I can share about that? That's what emotional intelligence is all about. Emotional intelligence is about the rain that may be happening in the background, but you are sitting under that umbrella nice and dry. Abraham and Lot is just one example of emotional intelligence in the Bible. And what I would encourage you to do, there are many good um, resources on emotional intelligence out there, but I believe the Bible has the core uh, cri uh, criteria, it's not the white red, but the structure and the foundations for emotional intelligence. And when you look at different stories in the Bible, you will start to notice through this framework, the concepts of self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, relationship management, and be able to see how that actually plays a significant part in helping you to be more excellent in the way that you are able to approach life. When you next face conflict, when you next face challenges, when you next face difficulties managing situations, when you next face stress, are you going to be like Abraham? Or are you going to react in the same way that you've always reacted? And if you react in the same way that you've always reacted, perhaps that's why you're not being able to reach true excellence. It's not about the level. It's about the purpose behind what you are trying to do. I'm going to pause for about 15 to 30 seconds, let you guys take a stretch, get a glass of water, go to the bathroom. I'm going to switch my slides over. And then we're going to go into the second part of the discussion. If you have any questions, I believe on the chat line, you are uh, there's a link there for you to ask questions. I will try and finish in, in, with enough time for question and answer at the end of the session on any of the topics that we covered today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of resilience. Okay, Resilience is a term that many people use nowadays. We talk about, about conflict management. First up, I'm going to talk about resilience and how this brings some of the scientific basis behind it and then talk a little bit about how that also uh, relates to excellence as well. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to a minute to just um, do your thing. I'll flick the slides across and then we'll keep going. All right, we'll keep going for those of you who are back and welcome for those of you who are joining us. So we just talked a little bit about Abraham and Lot. I'm going to use the same example of Abraham and Lot in the next um, series. We're going to continue on that story, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about resilience and the concept of resilience. Many people talk about resilience being something that you learn versus something that is built versus something that can be taken on and taken off. And this sometimes we overuse this word. People say you need to be resilient and be stronger. People associate, just like people associate excellence with perfection, people associate resilience with strength. If you are strong, when you face difficulty, when you face conflict, you'll be able to manage. If you're not strong, you will fall over when there's crisis. If you are not um, uh, resilient, you won't be able to deal with stress. So that's the way people equate it. But I want to look at the biblical model about how this looks like and how that is played out. see here there is a latin saying that is translated to english to something that means something like this varos canis canonam non est which sometimes yeah, well, people translate it in modern day english to dog eat dog you know like dog eat hot dog but dog eat dog and when we say dog dog eat 
dog. We usually talk about it in the context of a workplace or the world. It's a dog eat dog world, which means that everyone is fighting for survival. Not so much survival of the fittest per se as the evolutionary theory, but talking about struggle. There's a saying that goes something like this. The struggle is real. The struggle may be struggling to be on time, struggling to complete your work, struggling to meet your assignment deadline, struggling to keep to the speed limit for those of you who are drivers, struggling to survive. There may be a whole range of things, but the reality of the situation is that when we talk about stress, when we talk about excellence, most people are not so much talking about excellence when you're times of difficulty, but they're talking about survival. And so I want to talk a little bit about resilience and how resilience is both preventative and also complementary to growth when it comes to difficult situations. I told you before about the lockdown. This is what this is one of the most, uh, this is the shopping mall in the middle of Melbourne. Melbourne is a city of about four and a half million people. And this is the main shopping mall through the central business district. Usually on a Thursday or Friday night, even on the weekend, this place is packed. There are only trams here, no cars allowed. So people walk through this shopping mall. And you can see this was taken last week on the lockdown date. There is zero people walking around. I mentioned before the significant impact that lockdown has had. Again, it's not so much about the lockdown, but it's about the impact of crisis in someone's life. Some people put it like this, that COVID-19 has really affected the mental health component of people. And we see increased uh, risks. People are getting really depressed, very discouraged, very upset, and resigned to the fact that this is happening again and that this keeps happening again and again and again. Now, for those of you who uh, have, have dealt with some of the implications of the COVID pandemic, you'll know uh, maybe have family members who have fallen sick or maybe perhaps even friends or family who have passed away from COVID. It's a very, very difficult time. And not, I'm not trying to you know, turn the talk to COVID, but what it does is it, this again highlights how we manage and understand and deal with these types of situations. So some people say, well, if you are more resilient, you may be able to handle what the world throws at you. And so some people feel like they can, it's like eating a magic pill. I need to have a pill that gives me resilience, or I need to have a, uh, I can do a course that makes me more resilient, or I can do a, uh, you know, some sort of training that helps me to increase my resilience. Some people try different things. I need to be more mindful. I'll do yoga or meditation. I'll do um, relaxation to build up my resilience and help me to be more stress-free in times of difficulty. Because when I'm more stress-free, I can perform at my optimum and then be excellent. That's the logic. So people do these different things to try and build that up. I want to use the biblical model today to explain a little bit about how this works, starting from a scientific level and then moving to using a biblical story to make it more obvious. For those of you who like chemistry or who have studied chemistry or who pretended to study chemistry in high school, you remember some of these things. These are neurotransmitters. Uh, the neurotransmitters are like hormones or like chemicals. Maybe it's a better way of putting it, chemicals in the body that actually get transmitted or moved around or released at certain times, okay? And these are some examples of them. I'm gonna spend some time today talking about four main neurotransmitters. Again, this is not a science lecture. I'm using this because there's a scientific basis behind how this relates to excellence. You don't need to memorize. There's no test after this. You're not gonna fail at the end of the breakout session if you don't remember the name of the neurotransmitter or the exact chemical makeup or form. The body relies on neurotransmitters and hormones around the body. And here's one of them, okay? So the first one I wanna talk about is cortisol. Cortisol is the typical stress hormone. You remember earlier in the presentation, I talked a little bit about the stress response, people you know, getting fight or flight response. Cortisol is one of the things that really goes up when you're stressed. It helps to prompt the rest of the body to actually get into gear to fight the stress levels, fight, so to speak. When you have chronic stress, cortisol is always high. And cortisol being always high actually increases your risk of a whole range of things, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, a whole range of things. It's bad for your physical health in the long term. So if you are chronically stressed, you have poorer physical and mental and spiritual health. 
cortisol is really useful when you are stressed acutely, like in the instance, but we cannot have it elevated all the time. This is not something you want high at all situations. We often see kids in the hospital, right, in my profession, that have high cortisol when they are sick because being sick is a form of the body being stressed. And so we see the levels of cortisol go up. When you are relaxed, when, i.e. when you are asleep, your cortisol levels are usually lower. The second type of neurotransmitter is something called endorphins. I don't know how many of you like running. Maybe some of you like uh, marathon running. Last year, during uh, the break after lockdown, I ran my first and last half marathon. I, I'm a runner, but usually I stop at 10 kilometers because after 10 kilometers, it starts to wear out your joints and, and knees and so on. So, okay, we've got people who like distance running here. Distance running is a mental game. I figured it out because when I was training for the half marathon, because someone else wanted to do it and we thought, okay, it'd be a good idea to train during lockdown. We were allowed to go out of the house two hours a day to exercise. So a lot of people started running only during lockdown and then they stopped after the lockdown. <laughs> so that was me because I was at home. I didn't have to come to work every day. I had more time to do training. So I would go and do for a run. And I learned that distance running is tricky because it's not a physical game after 10 kilometers. After 10 kilometers, you can 15, 17, 20, 21 and a half kilometers, whatever it is for a half marathon. It's all mental. I didn't really feel any difference between 15 kilometers and 21. It was about the same. I could keep running if I wanted to. But that's if my mind said I wanted to keep running. And often what I started to notice as we were training, I was training for distance running, was I had to run three times a week at least, right? So you run you know, 5K, 8K, 13K or something like that, and like three times the space during the week. And you get into this rhythm of running. And many people I learned, I don't, I don't run so much anymore, but many people I learned love running because of the high that it gives them. And the high it gives them is because once it becomes a mental game, the mental game is how they make themselves stronger. So some people say you become more resilient when you start running because the more running you do, the more you test your mental toughness and the more you can block it out and more you can deal with stress. And one of the reasons people do that is because of the concept of endorphins. Endorphins are what are released when you run, when you exercise, when you do physical activity. Endorphin is a word that comes from two combined words, endogenous, morphine. Endogenous means produced in the body, not produced from outside. And morphine, everyone knows what morphine is, right? When you're in pain, you give someone morphine to make them less painful. So basically, endorphins are self-produced, body-produced morphine. When you run up to a certain level, the body will start producing endorphins. So you don't feel the tiredness and the pain anymore. So from 10 to 21K, you don't really feel it as much because it becomes a mental battle because the physical pain is being masked by the endogenous morphine, the endorphins. And many people talk about this. When you run, you go to the gym, you become more happy. And you become more happy because the endorphins are released and the endorphins make you happy. But the problem is that endorphins have the same effect as if you take morphine all the time. If you take morphine all the time, for those of you who are doctors, nurses, et cetera, no, you'll know that people get addicted to morphine. It's an opioid drug that makes you addicted. And people get addicted even to running because they get the release of endorphins all the time. And some of you will know, I don't know, maybe you have a friend that goes to the gym at 5 a.m. in the morning, every day, every night, 10 p.m. in the gym. Why do they go to the gym? There's nothing fancy about the gym, but it's because of the endorphins that come from the gym. I can guarantee you, if the same endorphins came from reading the Bible, there would be people reading the Bible 5 a.m. every day and 10 p.m. every night. But people get addicted to the endorphins because that's what gives them pleasure. So in, some, in stress, there's cortisol. There's also endorphins. Now, some endorphins is good. Endorphins is not bad. But um, endorphins are something that actually help um, to mask physical pain. Here's the third one. Uh, okay. oh, sorry, that, that was endorphins. Here's the third one. This one is called the happiness neurotransmitter. The happiness neurotransmitter is serotonin. In fact, in depression, in mental health, people get 
um, medication that uh, are known as a class of medication called serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. And what SSRIs do is they stop the serotonin from being degraded or absorbed or used up in your body to so boost the levels of serotonin. And here's why. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for contributing to your feelings of well-being and happiness, i.e. when you are specifically in the situations where you feel confident, where you feel proud, where you have a status, where you have power, where you have position, when you feel like you're important, that's serotonin being released. Let me give you an example of this. How many of you have been to a graduation ceremony? You've been to a graduation ceremony? I've been to graduation ceremony in university, right? I had 300, 400 people in my, grad, my medical school class, 335 people. It is a very, very boring thing. I don't know if you've ever been to graduation ceremony, it is so boring. You pay money to hire the gown to go to a graduation ceremony, to sit in the graduation ceremony for someone to read out all the names of the people that are graduating, right? That's how they do it in Australia. I, I don't know what they do in the Philippines, but that's what they do in Australia. They read out all the names and the person reading out the names always gets the name wrong. Always. And then you go up on stage and then they call your name out and then you have the hat and then you shake the person's hand and then you walk away later and then you go outside and then everyone is there and the fa your family members are there. Maybe your friends come and everyone wants to take a picture and then they take, give you flowers, they give you a teddy bear and then you throw the hat in the air. It's such a waste of time. You pay money to do this stuff. You just get the piece of paper. During COVID, no one had a graduation, right? They just got the, got the piece of paper and then that's it. They put it on the wall, the certificate. But everyone wants to go to the ceremony. And you know why? Who's the most excited about the ceremony? Your parents. For those of you students, I'm sure you can identify what I'm saying, right? My parents were the most excited when I graduated. Not me, my parents. But why do you do it? Many people, if you're an international student from overseas, and there are lots of international students who come to Australia, their parents will fly from overseas, pay big money, take a flight here, come to the, stay for a week, come to the ceremony to take pictures. And it makes them happy because their son or their daughter has graduated from university or from high school or from whatever course they've done. And you feel satisfied, not because you find the graduation ceremony very exciting, but because the people around you are happy. Yes? You're not happy because you've got a piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't do anything. It helps you get a job, sure. But the whole ceremony itself, that's why it's called a ceremony. It's a procession because other people are happy. And they're happy because you've gained a status or position. You've gained some, some sort of recognition. You've now got a master's, you've now got a PhD, you've now got a whatever bachelor's, you're the first person you know, in your family to go to university, all this type of stuff. And so people, when you are in a relationship with someone, i.e. parents and family and parents and child, graduation with parents and you have a leadership uh, role or you have they take pride in your achievements there's some status that is when serotonin is released it reinforces relationships okay this is how serotonin works so cortisol when you're stressed endorphins when you're running to mask the pain exercise act physical activity serotonin when there's power position status being proud the problem with serotonin is that you can trick the body into releasing serotonin, releasing serotonin. In a materialistic world, you can release your, uh, the, the serotonin to be gamed, to be tricked. Some people chase power and position because they get the serotonin hit when they get it. When they get promoted in work, they get serotonin. When people praise them for the work that they do, they get serotonin. Uh, the body releases serotonin. When they get recognition for the, the, the thing that they do, they do that. When, when you buy a new handbag or a new car or a new clothing or whatever, and people comment on it, you get a serotonin hit. Because everyone's like, oh, that person must be so important. They've got such a nice car. When everyone looks at you, oh, they've got new shoes. Well, they must, be, they must be really rich. Oh, I'm rich. Okay, I've got a serotonin. Here. And so our body conditions herself to be trained to want to release serotonin because it can be gamed and tricked in a materialistic world. And so we, people chase power, position, riches, materials because serotonin is released. So that's the, that's the downside, right? You've got um, uh, uh, 
you've got endorphins, you've got um, cortisol, you've got serotonin. And I, I forgot one more in the middle. There's also this concept of dopamine. Here's dopamine. Dopamine is a transmitter, neurotransmitter that's released in reward-seeking behavior, reward-motivated behavior. Okay, let me give you the most classic example of this. Dopamine is a very addictive thing. It is gained usually on a single-person basis. Serotonin requires two parties. Someone to praise you for your work, you get serotonin. Your parents to be happy when you graduate, relationship. Your boss to say, well done, relationship. Dopamine is by yourself. People who play computer games understand what dopamine is because every time you pass a level, you get a dopamine hit. That's how people do marketing online, right? They always want you to click things because the more you click, the more rewards you get. That's called gamification. People even give a term to it. People who are addicted to gambling or struggle with gambling, that's how it works. They win a little bit, they lose a lot. They win a little bit, they lose a lot. They win a little bit, they lose a lot because dopamine gets released. And so dopamine becomes an, a hit of you get like a, it's like a sugar, sugar uh, run. It's a sugar drive. You get a little bit of dopamine every time you do something that actually helps you to achieve a goal. The goal could be completing the level, could be winning a little bit of money in the gambling, uh, online gambling. It could be doing something. And so people become addicted to the dopamine without realizing that the behavior behind it is actually harmful. Okay, so let me summarize so far. Cortisol. Good for stress, not good long-term. Endorphins, good to mask pain, not good long-term. Dopamine, good in short hits, but very addictive. And people can forget about the behavior behind it. Serotonin, very good, helps to reinforce relationships, but people can trick it to make it something that becomes an inflation of their ego and their self and the status and the power that they have. So neurotransmitters in and of themselves are good, but, but they may not be helpful in some situations. So remember how we went into this, right? Resilience. People say to increase your resilience in difficult situations to become more excellent, you need to increase your cortisol. You need to increase your endorphins, go running more, go exercise. People say you need to increase your dopamine. Do things that increase your dopamine, make you happy. That's why people binge watch Netflix all the time because every episode gives them a dopamine hit. Number four, go and increase your serotonin. Do things that will give you serotonin. What do they do? Buy a new house, buy a new car, buy a new this. Online shopping took off in COVID in Australia because people just kept buying things online that they didn't need, they didn't want, they didn't see, they just want to buy something because it makes them feel good. And that is a challenge because those ways are coping mechanisms of how people cope with stress, cope with difficulty, cope with problems, build their resilience. But they are not permanent ways and they can be very destructive in the end if not used wisely in the correct situation it's good but if not used wisely it can be dangerous there's one more neurotransmitter that is vastly different this neurotranslator transmitter not translator neurotransmitter is called oxytocin oxytocin is also known as the love or cuddle hormone Oxytocin is a love or cuddle hormone because it is released when you do specific activities. Let me give you one example of that. Oxytocin is a neurotransmitter that has huge physical and physiological effects, including influencing behaviors and actions. When a mum who's breastfeeding, I think there was someone who was a for when a mum hears a baby cry oxytocin is released. That's the most classic example. In medicine, we talk about this concept called a letdown reflex. The letdown reflex is when a mum who is breastfeeding hears a baby crying, the milk production starts to be released so that they are going to feed their baby. Does that make sense? When their baby is crying, the instinctual response is the mum starts to release this neurotransmitter called oxytocin. In fact, it's so strong that sometimes when you are breastfeeding, you walk through a shopping center and someone else's baby cries, you also have the letdown reflex. For those of you who are moms or not uh, female, you probably understand this. I deal with this because this is what happens. This is what pediatrics, right? And so 
you can imagine if you've ever had a child yourself or you've ever seen a child or seen a parent or seen a mum at church or whatever, you will know that breastfeeding and feeding a baby is not an activity that is, if you pay them to do it, they wouldn't do it if they had, <laughs> unless it's their child. No one is going to voluntarily wake up at 3 a.m. to feed their baby. I don't know about you, but I like my sleep. And if you are not a parent, you will not wake up to feed someone else unless someone pays you really well. And even then, you might not want to do it. So here's what happens. Oxytocin is released as a neurotransmitter. When you do something for someone else with no gain or reward, Oxytocin is only released when you do something for someone else in an altruistic manner, sacrificial manner, when there is no gain or reward. In other words, when you do something for someone else with no ulterior motive, oxytocin is released. When you cuddle with someone, there's no release. The other person gets the benefit. When you hug someone, usually the other person gets the benefit. When you feed a baby, the baby gets the benefit, not you as the mom. Oxytocin has also recently been shown to inhibit addiction, boost immunity, and sometimes even now there's people starting to discover the, the, the more interesting stress-related responses. Oxytocin is released during stressful situations as well as cortisol. In stressful situations when oxytocin is released, what actually happens is that you get the ability, you get the chance, you get the opportunity to actually um, express that by helping other people with no benefit to you. So cortisol helps you to deal with a situation immediately, run away from the spider, run away from the lion, but oxytocin helps you to express that. So here's a very pointed question. During COVID-19 lockdown or restrictions, have you used the oxytocin that was released during that stressful situation to help someone else with no regard for your own benefit? Because that's excellent. That's the purpose behind why we live as Christians. If in the COVID breakdown, a breakdown lockdown, all you do is rush the to rush the supermarket to buy toilet paper to hoard it for yourself, that is not oxytocin release. That is cortisol driven. If in the lockdown all you do is run and run and run to make yourself feel better, that may be helpful for you, but it's not a long term solution. If in COVID lockdown and 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 this situation you've gone online to do online shopping to 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 pass the time and to to get rid of your sorrows, that's a serotonin hit. That is not a sustainable solution. If you've gone online to play computer games, watch TV, do all these types of things, well, in and of themselves, watching some documentaries may be okay. That's not the point. You are looking for a dopamine hit and the dopamine hit is not resilience built. Oxytocin is the only neurotransmitter. It's the only neurotransmitter that builds and builds and builds resilience over time with no perceivable benefit to you. You help someone else with no gain for yourself, but what you gain is resilience in stressful situations. They say that dopamine is the last um, hormone and oxytocin is the attachment hormone. So cortisol, ironically, inhibits oxytocin. So stressful situations, this is, this is battle here, tension here, cortisol, oxytocin. If you're in a constant situation where you're stressed, no wonder things go wrong. No wonder things go awry. No wonder things go and become difficult. Let me share with you some stories about how this works. This is my young professional um, group here in um, Melbourne. This is a picture of us a number of weeks ago when we could still meet without before the cases broke out again and we didn't have to wear masks. We have people from all over the world join our group. More than half of this group is non-Adventist. This group was set up really as an opportunity to reach people who uh, do not know about God, who may not be Christian, or who may be discovering Christ for the first time. It's really an opportunity to, um, to meet new people and to share with them about Jesus. I want to tell you the story about um, Heinrich and Lizzie. Heinrich is on the couch. He's wearing the purple top. Lizzie is the girl in the bottom left corner with red hair. 
Heinrich and Lizzie are from Austria. They're born and raised as Seventh-day Adventists. They moved to Australia because Lizzie is studying a master's degree in nursing uh, at a university in Melbourne. So they moved here about a year and a half ago, just about one month before COVID really took off here in Australia and we went to lockdown. So their entire time in Australia has been pretty much locked out <laughs> in their house doing online learning. So they moved from Austria to come to Australia and it was we met them the second week they were in Australia. They came to church and they became part of our group. And before long, they became really an integral part of our little group here. And our little group was trying to do different things. One of the things we do is a, a Bible study on Friday nights and that is open for anyone to join. And we were struggling to find a place that was central enough to meet, central enough to meet. Uh, in, in a place because we lived in different parts of the city and we have to travel and some people don't have transport and have to take public transport and so on and so forth. And so Heinrich and Lizzie, unbeknownst to us, began to pray about this. I mean, they're, they're visiting from, uh, they're here from overseas. They've got a small apartment, but they decided as they were praying that they would like to offer the house up for this Bible study every week. Now, offering up a house might sound like nothing to you, but to them, this is the first time they've ever done anything like that ever in their life. Because that means like sometimes 15 people in the house. That means cooking and cleaning and washing and all this sort of stuff that goes with it. I don't know about you, but like, you know, cooking for 15 people stresses me out. It might, stress, not, might not stress you guys out. I get a cortisol rush when I have to cook for 15 people. And so they said, no, this is what we want to do because we felt that God has called us to do that. And so this became sacrificial giving. So every night, Friday night, it would be there. During lockdown, it became on Zoom, but they would try and help to host a few things. Sometimes during the lockdown, we had groups of four or five allowed in the house. It would always be at the house. There would be four people there, five people there. They would be ready to go, ready to clean, ready to cook. Week in, week out, one and a half years in. This is sacrificial giving. And you know, a few weeks ago when we talked, we are praying about what to do when... Um, uh, for our group this year, this is how it worked. It was sacrificial giving. They said that was the biggest blessing that they had to be able to share their house. And from now on, wherever they go in the world, when they return overseas after their study is done, they will look for a house that can be used for ministry because of the blessing that it gives them. The way we describe blessings, the way we describe blessings when we give is actually a description of the impact of oxytocin. People in the world don't understand what oxytocin is. Sorry, don't understand what blessings are when it comes to resilience, but they understand what oxytocin releases. But they're the same thing. Let me tell you about Catherine. Catherine's the um, girl in the bottom center screen, pink top. We, um, last year during lockdown, we decided that we would like to try an uh, outreach project called Lifebox. Lifebox is really an opportunity for us to be able to um, share plant-based healthy eating uh, and plant-based foods with people and healthcare workers who were stuck during the first quarantine and the lockdown period where there were lots of cases of COVID to be able to give them free plant-based foods. And so Catherine was a key part of that, organizing that team to be able to do that. Lots of volunteer time, lots of volunteer efforts. We gave away over 1,200 meals over like two months of uh, cooking all plant-based, vegetarian, uh, vegan, etc. And included Bible verses and opportunities and different um, ways for them to connect and improve their mental health as well. From those efforts, actually some people have begun to start and continue even now up to today, uh, Bible study efforts from that time period. And so what, uh, you know, it's a tremendous blessing, all done out of volunteer work, all done out of um, uh, the goodness of their own heart. And Catherine, when we're reflecting on, on the Lifebox experience, really found that that was something that helped her to grow, not only as a Christian, but grow in terms of her faith. Remember 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7, we want to excel in faith, in knowledge, in earnestness. This is what it's talking about. Oxytocin release is how it happens. So how does this relate back to Abraham? I told you, I promised that uh, we're Abraham. And the, I took this picture because this is the next part of the story about Abraham and Lot. And I'm going to close after that and, and give you some time for questions. Genesis chapter 14, verse 8 tells us, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zohar, marched out and drew up the battle lines in the valley of Sidon. Okay, so this is the next chapter. Abraham and Lot have now gone their separate ways. Abraham's over here in the desert and um, Lot's over there near Sodom and Gomorrah. And people were not happy with Lot. 
they were like, this guy coming to invade our land. This is a new competitor on the business market. We've got to kick him out. So they gathered together all these people. You can see the went to the Valley of Sidim, blah, blah, blah. Four kings against five. There's some fighting here. Now the Valley of Sidim was full of tar pits. And when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abraham's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Full out war. So you can imagine Sodom and Gomorrah, right? They're, they're going, there's lots just moved there, just set up a new business there and set up the new business marketplace. Everything's going well. There's a civil war breaks out, uh, fighting all over. Everything gets destroyed. All the possessions gone. Lot gets carried away. What would you do if you were Abraham? Serves Lot right. He got what he deserved. And that's sometimes how we, we react to resilience, right? Or too bad for them. If their resilience was stronger, they wouldn't be facing that situation. You know, they just got to build it up. I'm tough. I can deal with it. You got to be tougher. And so here we see how this plays out in the next verse. A man who had escaped and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshkor and Abner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the train men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as then. Do you know how far that is? 360 kilometers away. I don't know about you, 360 kilometers in those days. You just no car to go 360 kilometers, no plane or boat. They're riding horses through the night. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with the woman and the other people. When you are faced with a difficult situation, what endorph what neurotransmitter do you look for? When Abraham heard about Lot, he did not hesitate. There was no like, ah, too bad for Lot, should have been more secure. I told him to have you know, better security. I told him to not go there. I gave him the choice. He deserves what he gets. He does not say anything of the sort. When he is there, the first instantaneous thing he says is, I'm going to go. Let's go. He drops everything, gets all the trained men from his house. He even leaves the people in his household vulnerable. He says, sorry, I have to go. Everyone who can fight, come, let's go. 360 kilometers in one night, chases down the kings, kills everyone, takes them as far as the north of Damascus, takes all the goods, takes all the relatives, takes Lot, takes his possessions together with everyone. He doesn't just take Lot and leave everyone else. He brings everyone back, everything back, even the possession, precious possessions. He's not paid. No one asked him to do it. No one, he's, there's no reward for this. He leaves his own family vulnerable. He leaves his own business behind. He suffers probably some business loss having to chase this crazy nephew of his. Is this the way we react when crisis strikes? If we are resilient, do we lend a hand to others or do we go chasing the other neurotransmitters? Abraham rescues Lot and look what he does next. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, he's come back now, right? He brings everyone back to Sodom. Possessions, goods, livestock, Lot, Lot's possessions. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Here, here's the reward, right, Abraham? Thank you for helping me. I'll give you the reward. Just drop everyone off. Take all the gold. Take all the silver. Take all the life. Let that be the reward for your service that you went to you know, rescue everyone for me. Look at Abraham's response. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. When you are in crisis, when you are in conflict, when you are in a difficult time, do you do things because you want to get the praise? Do you do things because you want to get the recognition? Do you do things because you want to get the, uh, the, 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 uh, the position, the power? Do you do things because you want the reward? 
Do you do things because you may get endorphins, you may get dopamine, you may get serotonin, or do you do things because you are sacrificial and giving? In order to be excellent, in order to understand the purpose, that has to be at the crux. Abraham was very clear. I came to save people. I didn't come for a reward. I came to get Lot and I came to get everyone else as well as Lot because I value life. And I value that my God will protect me whatever I do. The true secret to excellence is understanding the purpose and how oxytocin works. When a parent will sacrifice anything for their child, that's oxytocin. When you will sacrificially give for God, that's oxytocin. When you will sacrificially help a brother or sister in need, that's oxytocin. That is excellence. That is how purpose comes about. Some of you may have heard of this concept. I'm going to close with this story of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a famous AA is the, the name for it. AA was actually a started off to help people who were struggling with addiction overcome that addiction. And they have a list of 12 rules of AA. If you don't know about them, you can Google it. You can Google it later and find out about them. It's actually quite interesting. Number one rule, when they come into this AA meeting, they often have to, to agree to these things. Number one is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. It goes on and on and on. And actually, the core crux of this Alcoholics Anonymous, the most successful program for helping people to quit alcohol addiction, has been the central point of oxytocin overload. It's actually a spiritual program. It was formed right at the back of the start in the initial days by people who had a spiritual foundation. It refers to God and admitting to God about the powerlessness that they need God's help to change. And the last number 11 says this, seeking through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying for a knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. That's a very interesting statement for a secular organization. Number 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, number one to 11, I won't read them all out today. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So the crux of AA is this. When you have overcome your addiction, it is your responsibility to help other people to overcome it themselves. Not by themselves, but through the experiences that you have gone through, you lend a hand to others with no payment, no reward. It is part of your mandate. It is part of your purpose. The purpose is to carry this same message that you learn to other people. And isn't that the gospel message? Because when you experience the gospel, you want and you are empowered, you are obliged, you, are, you are, have no other reason or feeling but to want to transmit that to other people. The spiritual awakening that you have when you meet Jesus is what drives you to the oxytocin to give of yourself to God to be used for other people's salvation. In fact, this principle was first demonstrated by God. God is in the business of giving people, giving medals to people who sacrifice, not in people who are looking for dopamine, for serotonin, for other ways to boost their resilience. Luke chapter 9, verse 24 to 25, and I'll close with this verse says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? The true way to resilience is found by the example on the cross. Jesus demonstrates excellence by helping us to understand that resilience is built by oxytocin and not built by sugar hits of other neurotransmitters. It's simply a scientific explanation for what we go through, whether it's conflict, whether it's building up resilience to conflict and through stress and to difficulty, whether it's helping someone else through difficulty, whether it's understanding the situation to work through these difficulties, excellence comes when you're very clear about the purpose at the core of what you want to do. Whoever will lose their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? That is the core of excellence. You can stumble into mediocrity, but you have to be purpose. You have to purpose to be excellent. 
On Sabbath morning, I will continue the second breakout session. I'm going to switch tack a little bit and talk a bit about the concept of persuasion, of influence, of understanding what that looks like in a biblical context, of understanding what it looks like in terms of interacting with other people. We learned about emotional intelligence in the first session. We talked about self-awareness, talked about self-regulation, talked about social awareness, talked about relationship management. We want to understand a little bit more about how we can use those things in the concept of persuasion and influence for the gospel, not for own gain, not for dopamine or serotonin, but for oxytocin to help to lead others to Christ in that we grow ourselves. So this time I'm going to close with prayer and I, I'm not sure how the question and answer section works, but I will hand over to, I think, the moderator to help with that. I'm very happy to answer any questions, but let's pray as we close this session. Father, we thank you for this time. We are grateful for the opportunity to come and to gather and to study and to dig into your word. Father, thank you for helping us to understand that true excellence comes from the purpose and the drive behind why we want it. It is something that we are given the opportunity to experience through you and through your word. And we thank you for that chance. And we thank you for revealing to us through science, through the Bible, through different examples. May it be each and everyone's desire here today to experience both emotional intelligence and oxytocin for the furtherance of your kingdom as we grow in you each day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.